Egypt, one of the greatest civilizations of the ancient world. Two centuries of Egyptology, of exploration and excavation, have unlocked incredible secrets and have revealed fabulous discoveries. Now, using state-of-the-art techniques and the very latest research, these finds are being revisited, re-examined. For the first time, the world's leading experts have come together to reveal the ultimate list, the 10 greatest discoveries of ancient Egypt. Each of these 10 great discoveries is a treasure in its own right, but they are much more than that. It's a key, a way in, to one of the most extraordinary civilizations that our world has ever seen. These discoveries are really doorways into the past, and they permit us to see how the ancient Egyptians lived, how they thought, what they did. Objects found decades, even centuries ago, still pose a challenge. They have to be decoded. How did secret messages turn this simple tomb into a resurrection machine? The scenes themselves and the words inscribed on the walls of these tombs are like computer code or an instruction manual. What lay behind the wave of violence that desecrated Egypt's most beautiful tombs? It definitely was organized crime. Well-structured, organized groups of men. They built on a scale that would not be equaled for thousands of years. How did they do it? No one is entirely sure how people, using very simple tools and a lot of sweat, managed to construct such an astonishing monument. Across 30 centuries, their culture survived repeated invasion, outlasted all its rivals. The Egyptians had such a strong sense of culture, such a long history, that really they changed the invaders more than the invaders changed them. They created a superpower that dominated for longer than any other in history. Now, science, technology, and the latest research will reveal the lives and the minds of the Egyptians. Dr. Zahi Hawass is the highest ranking archeologist in Egypt today and is guardian of all Egyptian antiquities. Working with a team of leading scientists and traveling from one end of the country to the other, he will guide us through Egypt's greatest discoveries. We are taking you in an adventure that you will never forget in your life. The first discovery reveals the ingenious piece of technology that allowed Egypt to become one of the greatest ancient civilizations. This discovery was a miracle. It shows the skills of the Egyptians. And remarkably, this technological breakthrough is locked inside a boat. Over four and a half thousand years ago, the Pharaoh Khufu ordered the construction of the Great Pyramid. What he buried beneath it is, in its own way, every bit as impressive. The amazing thing about this discovery it is how the Egyptians, 4,600 years ago, constructed this incredible boat. The Khufu ship is the most extraordinary artifact in the world. 13 stories tall, if you stand it on its end, 1,200 parts, and held together with little pieces of wood and a kind of sewing. The site at Giza had been excavated many times. But this find was made by chance. The discovery happened by accident completely. Many of the major discoveries always come with luck. It was 1952. Archaeologist Kamel El Malak was supervising the clear up of an area right by the Great Pyramid. This south of the pyramid was completely covered with debris and stone rubble. Then they began to clean the stone rubble. As they were clearing, they found these large slabs of limestone that were very carefully laid. Curious, El Malak bored a small hole through one of them. When this man came and looked inside, he said to me, I did 
smell history. He discovered 41 huge limestone blocks, weighing between 17 and 20 tons. They covered a deep pit over 100 feet long. But it was the contents of the pit that excited Egyptologists. It was this huge pile of wood and rope and oars, which gave the game away. Why would Khufu bury a ship in the desert beside his pyramid? The answer tells us how the Egyptians saw death and what the pharaoh believed would happen to him. The pyramid would hold his mortal remains, but his soul would leave. It would be transformed. Khufu was a king and a god. So when he died, he became one with the sun god. Ascending to the heavens, the pharaoh would become one with the sun god Ra. Unified, they would make the sun's daily journey across the sky. They would be carried, the Egyptians believed, in a great boat. The idea of doing that made perfect sense to the Egyptians because they saw the path of the boat as being not flying through the sky, but rather traveling on the rivers that surrounded their whole entire world. In Egyptian thinking, this boat had a clear, practical purpose. It would be used in the afterlife. The Khufu boat was intended to carry its master through the heavens. It played a vital religious role and this is a sign of something else, the fact that boats and water were central to Egyptian life. The Khufu boat is a fabulous testament to the importance of the Nile to the ancient Egyptians. Boats meant the Nile, and the Nile was Egypt. Egyptians relied on the Nile for food, for water, for irrigation, but most of all, they relied on the Nile to move them from place to place. The Nile linked the north and south of Egypt, the Egyptians traded with the outside world via the Nile. It was the wealth the river brought that caused their civilization to grow. The Nile was the most important thing for the Egyptians to make this civilization. And that's why we can say that with the Egyptians, the Nile built ancient Egypt. Treasure, gold and jewels came from Nubia in the far south. The hard granite which built Egypt's finest monuments traveled hundreds of miles by river from Aswan. Pharaohs sent trading expeditions to the land of Punt, a thousand miles to the south. Boat-based trade bore vast resources into the country and allowed the pharaohs of Egypt to build an empire. The importance of boats to ancient Egyptians is clear from wall art all across the country. But artwork cannot reveal the ingenious techniques they use to build such massive vessels. For archaeologists, the discovery of this real boat, perfectly preserved by the manner of its burial, is like a time capsule. It looked as if the edges of these timbers had just come out of the shipyard and that not a second had passed over the next 4,500 years. Archaeologists can investigate ancient boat building technology as if they were there at its construction 45 centuries ago. Each of the hull's 1,200 pieces was carved by hand. You have this very complex interlocking jigsaw of the planks themselves. Each piece fit individually and particularly into the piece that was above it, below it, to the ends of it. But it is how these pieces are joined that is remarkable. The Egyptian did not use nails or anything to construct the boats. No screws, no rivets, no glue. This boat is held together by grass. The grass is called halfa, and it's common all over Egypt. There are these long strands of grass, which are very rough, but you rub them together in a particular way, and it forms a very strong, yet flexible rope. Restorers have created a model of the boat at one to a hundred scale. This is how they used the ropes to construct the joins pieces in the boat. Incredible. 
The development of this technique offered the Egyptians an advantage over other cultures. At the time that the Khufu ship was built, most other places that we know about were only making dugout canoes out of logs. Sewn plank technology meant the Egyptians could build much larger vessels than other rival cultures. They could carry greater loads, travel greater distances. They could trade throughout the known world. The Egyptians didn't just paddle back and forth on the Nile. They were also fully capable of sailing out into the Mediterranean, places they wanted to go. This was the basis of tremendous economic success. It laid the foundation for 3,000 years of civilization. It helped create one of the most successful superpowers that the world has ever seen. The Khufu boat is the first of Egypt's 10 greatest discoveries because boats sparked the birth of an empire. Wealth brought by supersized boats paid for supersized construction. Egypt built temples and monuments on a scale not matched in antiquity. But these temples and monuments could never have been built if the ancient Egyptians had not mastered the skills needed to quarry stone in vast quantities. Without stone, there would have been no statues or monuments. Much of what we know of the Egyptians, we know because of the records they left in stone. Next, a team of scientists attempt to unlock the secrets of ancient Egypt's master masons. In a brand new experiment, they will try to harness the power that built a nation and left an extraordinary legacy. Egyptology's greatest discoveries give us a glimpse of an alien civilization, one that endured for 3,000 years. Its legacy is a series of constructions so large, so perfect, that they inspire awe even today. Scientists are trying to puzzle out how, when all that was available was manpower, the Egyptians managed to quarry vast blocks of stone. Blocks such as the unfinished obelisk. They left it in situ as an evidence to teach us how the Egyptians cut the obelisk. The unfinished obelisk weighs over 1,000 tons, more than 500 SUVs. It lies in the ancient quarry of Aswan in Upper Egypt. The obelisk was never removed from its quarry. Archaeologists have tried to understand why, after so much work, it was abandoned. If finished, it would have towered 10 stories above the ground. Decorated with images and hieroglyphs, it would have stood as a vital component in a temple complex. The obelisk was the symbol of connection between the king and the sun god. Obelisks are pieces of precision spiritual technology. For the Egyptians, an obelisk was a symbol of the sun. It was the ray of the sun, so it was sort of a power conductor. Working like a spiritual lightning conductor, obelisks could collect and channel energy from the heavens. You had to have it in one solid piece of rock. If you had it broken, it would mean that the sunbeam was being broken, and thus you would shatter the power of the god. So when the engineers discovered a crack in the obelisk at Aswan, they abandoned it. A piece of bad luck for the ancient Egyptians, which is a piece of good luck for science. One of the things in archaeology that is almost as important as successes are the failures. Evidence on and around the obelisk is revealing how the ancient quarrymen excavated the massive stones. Like a thousand-ton time machine, it offers a snapshot of 3,000-year-old work in progress. Using the evidence from the unfinished obelisk in a brand new experiment, scientists hope to demonstrate how this was possible. We began to discover amazing things that did enrich our knowledge about obelisks for the first time. 
Adil Kalani has spent a career investigating ancient quarrying techniques. This is a good example for natural cracks in granite layers, which is really very important to looking for before to start working. Granite has naturally occurring fault lines where the rock is already weak. By identifying and targeting these fault lines, the ancient engineers could begin the process of splitting the stone from the bedrock. It would be the ease of chiseling rock because there, there would, you'd have to cut the face, you'd have to kind of break pieces out of it, but there'd always be this plane of weakness that would help separate the rock in an expeditious manner. In the second phase, laborers bashed handheld stone pounders into the fracture line to wear the rock down. These early sledgehammers were made of dolerite, a stone much harder than granite. But the technique took time, and time was a luxury that the quarrymen did not have. Pharaohs always wanted their monuments done in a hurry. Many pharaohs were worried that they simply wouldn't be around long enough. The average reign of a pharaoh was less than a decade, and no pharaoh would trust his legacy to his successor. You had all of eternity for your monuments to last, but you had a very short lifespan in which to get them built. From the sheer number of granite obelisks and statues across Egypt, it's clear that the ancient quarrymen found a solution. Beneath the quarry, the archaeologists found the clues which tell us what the solution was. What we have here Actually, it's all the story. It's like an open book. It tells us everything about what, what the Egyptian made. Within the strata are charred mud bricks, burnt wood chips, and heat fractured shards of stone. From this, Adil believes he's worked out how Egypt's engineers accelerated the quarrying process. The Egyptian used fire to help them for splitting the stone. Heat from a fire would cause the rock to expand, and cooling would cause the rock to contract. This process weakens and can even split the rock. In theory, if the Egyptians could control this, they could split large sections of the granite. But Adil has not tested the theory till now. I'm excited to see the result, because it's a new discovery. Exactly as the ancient engineers did, Adil selects a fault line in the rock. Mud bricks found at the unfinished obelisk site suggest that the ancient engineers built a wall to contain and control the fire. The fire raises the temperature of the rock to 800 degrees. This expands and stresses the rock. After 60 minutes of intense heat, it is safe for Adil to approach. Water causes the temperature to drop by 85% in seconds. The rock rapidly contracts. Ooh. It's very hot, very, very hot. But what damage has the heat done? Adil can now experiment whether the fire-weakened stone is easier to split than a second untreated fracture. After half an hour, he calls stop. Without fire, the workmen on the control test have made little impact on the fracture line. But at the burnt fracture, the crack is crumbling. You can see how the fire sitting affected with the granite layers. It's working very, very fast more than what we have expected before. That explains how the ancient Egyptian made a lot of obelisks in very, very short times. It's therefore likely that the way to quarry such large amounts of rock in such a short amount of time would be with the aid of fire. One of the main mystery of the ancient Egyptian techniques solved by this operation today. The unfinished obelisk offered the clues, then experimental archaeology showed that the theory could work. It explains how the Egyptians could quarry stone on a scale that was almost superhuman. We discovered exactly how they did cut an obelisk. 
These great monuments still have the power to inspire awe. They were built thousands of years ago without any of our modern technology, and we're just beginning to understand how. But the third discovery takes us beyond technology, to Egypt's master builders, the men who created one of the most recognizable landmarks in history. The greatest discoveries made in Egypt reveal the secrets of a powerful and dramatic civilization that lasted for 3,000 years. The ancient Egyptians built some of the most impressive monuments in the world, and the most impressive of all is the Great Pyramid. The third discovery concerns the people who built it. No one is entirely sure how people, using very simple tools and a lot of sweat, managed to construct such an astonishing monument. Now, science is about to reveal the answer to this mystery. Until recently, a common picture of Egypt was a country where pharaohs and nobles commanded huge armies of slaves. But new discoveries redraw this image. They reveal a sophisticated social hierarchy and worker welfare, a society that would be recognizable to today's workers, union officials, bosses, and CEOs. The pyramids are located at Giza. Four and a half thousand years ago, the great pharaoh Khufu ordered the construction of what is still the largest tomb ever built. Climbing 500 feet above a plateau, it weighs as much as 17 Empire State Buildings. People have claimed that the Great Pyramid must have been built by aliens, or using spells chanted by priests with secret mystical powers. This is because its scale almost defies logical explanation. Until recently, many believed that it was built by gangs of thousands of slaves. But now, Dr. Hoas has made a discovery that reveals the mystery of who built the pyramids. I was able to write the history of the pyramid builders from the discovery of the tombs of the pyramid builders. The discovery is a tale of patient detective work and archaeological forensic science. In 1990, Dr. Hawass found some mysterious evidence. We began the excavation, and I found very strange things. I found bones and wheat seeds, and I said, what's this? They realized that the builders' tombs were constructed of the same material as the pyramids themselves. Chunks of limestone, granite, and basalt from what's left over of building the pyramid. This rock was what they'd used to fashion a tomb for their king. With the pieces they hadn't needed, they built tombs for each other. Further up the hill, Dr. Hawass's team discovered more elaborate tombs. One bore a name. Some hieroglyphic inscription. And actually, he was an inspector, Saj, the overseer of the workmen who dragged the stones. So the workforce clearly had an organized hierarchy. The overseer was buried higher up the hill than the ordinary workman, a reflection of his higher status. The evidence in the tombs suggests that workers had defined roles, distinct responsibilities. It was much like a modern construction crew. This is another unique tomb that I found. This tomb belonged to a man named Nephethys. Now we can see his name, Nephethys. But really what's unique in my opinion, look at the scenes. I have never seen it at all, the making beer and also baking bread. And this is why I really believe that Nephethys could be the one who was in charge of the bakery. The museum in Cairo contains statuettes found in Giza. 
These show the various roles of the citizens, including baking bread and making wine. Other painted reliefs show scribes keeping accounts and records for the tradesmen. Again, it points to a workforce organized along familiar lines, like a modern industrial community. And they appear to have been well valued and well cared for. The evidence reveals that there was a medical aid program. We found that many workmen had accidents, like stones will fill on their hand and on their legs. They were involved in moving heavy stones. All the skeleton of men and women had a stress on their back. Still, the forensic evidence shows that the level of care they received was surprisingly sophisticated. Janet Monge is a physical anthropologist who specializes in the study of ancient bones. We see the shafts show clear evidence that at some point, uh, well before the death of the individual, the bone was actually fractured. The bones are set really well to each other, probably were immobilized for a period of time. And, you know, we would say, you know, by today's standards, these are really superb healing process in these individuals. He did a good job. Clearly, these workers were highly valued by their employers. Being a worker was a rare privilege. You were well paid, you were well looked after, and it was, in fact, a cushy job. The pyramid builder's tombs reveal an organized structure of professionals and skilled artisans working within an ordered workforce. They were supported by a sophisticated employee welfare system. This discovery can prove one important thing, that pyramids were not built by slaves. Because the tombs at Giza were of ordinary people, they seem to have been ignored by treasure seekers. It was another tomb, kept sealed for 35 centuries, which produced Egyptology's best known discovery. The tomb of the most famous of all pharaohs, Tutankhamun. Ancient Egypt is one of the most long-lasting civilizations in history. It was ruled over by the most powerful kings. These are statues of real men. Who were they? What were they like? Archaeologists are trying to find out in the tomb of the pharaoh Tutankhamun. This is not the icon for a statue. It is the icon of the whole world. Who was the man behind the golden mask? The Valley of the Kings, on the west bank of the Nile. The Valley of the Kings contains 63 tombs. But for centuries, the one belonging to Tutankhamun lay hidden. In 1922, the great explorer and Egyptologist Howard Carter set out to find it. Howard Carter stayed for five years, five seasons, trying to find the tomb. Until one day in the morning, when the workmen began to clean around, they found 15 steps lead to the entrance of the tomb. The tomb descended 30 feet into the limestone rock of the valley. The end of the shaft was blocked. Carter punched a hole. And he saw in this room wonderful things. The tomb contained not only the body of the pharaoh, but over 3,000 treasures buried with him. Ever since, the tomb has been a magnet for Egyptologists, examining and analyzing the mummy and its treasures. And now, archaeologists can go deeper than ever. They can see the boy king as he's never been seen before. Archaeologists are using modern medical science to study his 3,500-year-old body. CT scans take thousands of x-rays of a body and put them together to produce a 3D image. The CT scan is wonderful, really, in archaeology. You can actually see everything. You can see how this king died, when he died. You can look at everything. 
Experts are investigating a mysterious hole in the back of King Tut's head. Could this be the wound that killed him? If you look at the skull, you'll find there is a hole in the back of the head. There is a lot of damage to the upper vertebrae, perhaps even the base of the skull, at the frame and magnum, the place it connects. The wound is consistent with damage done in an attack. That hole made everyone to believe that the golden boy was murdered. Did the young king meet a violent death? A clue might lie in the ancient process of mummification. Mummification is as old as Egypt. No one's very sure how the ancient Egyptians decided to mummify the dead, but presumably because the desert naturally dries out people. When animals die and lie in the desert, the Egyptians would have seen those, and they would see that they were perfectly preserved. First thing that the Egyptians did was to really desiccate the body, and they did this by using something called natron. Without natron, you couldn't make a mummy. Natron works like the sachets of silica gel that are used to keep electronic equipment dry today. Natron's basically a mixture of salt and baking soda, and what it does is it just draws away all the liquid in your body, and that's what makes a mummy. But certain organs have too much water in them to mummify in this way. You leave the organs in, they sort of rot and explode. So the next step was to remove the internal organs and the brain. They'd actually cut off the head, poke it, prod it out, and then leave it empty. So could the head wound, in fact, be a result of the mummification process, rather than an injury that killed him? At the University of Pennsylvania, Janet Monge has been studying the CT scans of King Tut's mummy. When damage occurs before the time of death of an individual, it's called antemortem damage. And generally, if it's on bone or tissue, you'll see some healing if the person lived. This looks like a post-mortem damage. It could be something that occurred at the time of the embalming process. The hole in King Tut's skull is consistent with the type of hole made during the mummification process. It has nothing to do at all with uh, uh, murder or anything, and there is no foul play. How the king died remains a mystery, but science can help to reveal how he lived to get inside the head and life of a ruler of Egypt. It appears the pharaoh did not look as regal as his death mask suggests. He has this nice square chin. Uh, except for that, his face is quite slender, quite slight. Of course, I don't think you would want to make fun of the king. But if the king was in a schoolyard, I think that he might be the kid that you gave the little nickname to, like Bucky or something like that. The scans clearly show the boy king had buck teeth, unlike his famous mask. The treasure with which the boy king was buried is revealing more insights. Tutankhamun's tomb has produced more riches than all the discoveries of Egypt put together. This famous mask was buried with six whole chariots and millions of dollars worth of gold. But what makes this burial unique is the fact it was found absolutely intact. Beyond the sheer razzle-dazzle bullion factor of all this gold that is measured in hundreds of pounds practically, uh, we have a complete set of burial equipment of a pharaoh of Egypt. The artifacts go some way to reveal the personality of the pharaoh. They were designed to the same standard as those he would have used in life. It's amazing to us that they would expend so much energy to create something like one of these little jar stoppers made of alabaster. And they're perfect, exquisite works of art. But they were never meant to be seen by people. They were buried in the king's tomb, never to be seen again. The type of artifacts and the care with which they are crafted give us an insight into how Tutankhamun lived. The Egyptians believed that your afterlife was much like this life, except better. So you had to take everything with you. The objects Tutankhamun wanted in his tomb and the afterlife were the ones he had enjoyed during his lifetime. 
We know that he liked a particular Egyptian game called Senate because he was buried with everything from a large formal Senate board and box table to a tiny little traveler version made of ivory that was only about this big. Tutankhamun was the supreme ruler of a superpower. These artifacts remind us of his youth and perhaps offer us a glimpse of his character. Where Carter's discovery showed the world the pharaoh, modern science is showing us the man. Further investigations of the tomb's artifacts and Tut's mummy are likely to reveal more details about the real human being behind the mask. But in ancient Egypt, like today, the vast majority of the population were not kings and queens. They were ordinary working men and women who formed the heart of a nation. Through the next discovery, Egyptologists can get a glimpse of these ordinary people, the citizens of ancient Egypt. Ten great discoveries made in Egypt reveal an extraordinary civilization. But while the ruins that stand let us see what ancient Egypt looked like, it's much harder to know how its people behaved. It really is a peephole, a voyeuristic peephole into life in ancient Egypt. The fifth discovery offers a chance to understand the lives of ordinary citizens in the town of the tomb builders. The town of Deir el Medina gives a rare insight into daily life in ancient Egypt. It stood on the west bank of the Nile. The remains of an uncontaminated Egyptian town make a rare and very valuable discovery. Daryl Medina remains pretty much untouched as the villagers left it. So this is really a huge resource for archeologists in reconstructing the lives of ancient Egyptians. It survives because it was built of stone. Most other ancient Egyptian towns were built on the Nile floodplain from mud brick, which washes away. The spectacular and very lucky thing about Daryl Medina is that it survived at all. It was home to 280 people, and it was built in an unlikely location. It's high up in the desert, an hour's walk from the Valley of the Kings. This leads archaeologists to believe that it was purpose-built to house the people who worked in the valley. They were charged with the building, the constructing, and also the decoration of the king's tombs in the valley. Families appear to have lived in their own single-story houses. This is actually the front door of a house that really I believe that this man was one of the overseer, and he should be a very uh, influential person. Craftsmen, goldsmiths, and tomb builders held high status in a land where most of the population worked long, hard hours as farmers. Workmen had a pretty cushy job when it comes down to it. It seems that on average, they worked maybe two out of three days. They would receive fish and wine on special occasions. They probably liked the job that they had. As well as constructing the tombs of their pharaohs, the citizens of Deir el Medina built their own. And by examining artwork on their walls, archaeologists can begin to piece together the lives of the people who lived there. We can really actually learn a lot about daily life from Deir el Medina tombs. The art shows a thriving community of prosperous and successful individuals. But the paintings on the walls reveal how the villagers wanted to be seen, not how they actually were. When you look at the tombs, when you look at the monuments, they're on their best behavior, dressed in their Sunday best, living an ideal life. But it's an ideal. But there is further evidence that offers clues as to the private lives of the citizens. All kinds of things are going on, stuff that they didn't necessarily want you to know about. The clues are everywhere. 
the whole cliffs around the city are limestone. So any piece of the mountain that comes off at a nice flat angle like this is a potential riding surface. And this potential was fully exploited by the residents of Deir El Medina. For the ancient Egyptians, we can compare this to a post-it note. They were able to use these just by stooping down and picking up a piece of stone off the ground. There you go, writing material. These shards, known by the Greek word ostraker, were used to document both official records and private notes. The fact that ostraker were used to send messages between friends provides experts with unique insights that were previously unknown in the archaeological record. We can see the real Egyptians essentially letting their hair down. Ostraka reveal how they spent their personal time. They like to drink, they obviously like to fornicate, and they love to gossip. From this Ostraka, you can reconstruct the life. 3,000 years ago, how they lived and everything about them from the inscribed limestone. The evidence at Deir el Medina reveals that its residents had lives not unlike our own. It tells us for the first time this discovery, not about kings and queens as we know all the time, but tell us about the common people and the life of the common people. But they lived these lives amongst the tombs of the dead. The Egyptians were a very spiritual people. They believed that the dead continued to influence every aspect of life in Egypt, from beyond the grave. For the sixth of Egypt's 10 greatest discoveries, Dr. Hawass will reopen a tomb that has remained closed to the public for decades. He'll discover what the Egyptians believed was a 300-yard-long magical supercomputer. When brought together, the 10 greatest discoveries reveal an overview of life in ancient Egypt. But it's impossible to understand Egyptian life without understanding their beliefs about the afterlife. The sixth discovery, the tomb of Seti I, offers an incredible insight. What we have here is essentially the hitchhiker's guide or the rough guide to the afterlife. Investigations here are revealing the secret code that turned a simple hole in the ground into a resurrection machine. The Valley of the Kings contains 63 tombs. One of the largest is the tomb of Pharaoh Seti I, it provides a wealth of information about ancient Egyptian attitudes to the afterlife. Seti I's tomb is really one of the most extraordinary tombs that we have in the King's Valley. Seti's is one of the tombs in the Valley of the Kings on the west bank of the Nile. Late in the summer of 1817, an Italian explorer called Giovanni Belzoni arrived at the site. Belzoni had been a circus strongman but he devoted his second career to Egyptology. Through careful surveying of the geology of the valley, Belzoni discovered eight tombs in just two weeks. And by week three, he had more than doubled the number of tombs discovered. Nevertheless, it wasn't until the morning of October the 16th, 1817, that Belzoni made the find that would seal his reputation. When Belzoni found this tomb in 1817, it was a miracle. His eyes were shining. He found a small corridor, and he thought it's intact, too. To protect the wall art from the moisture in visitors' breath, Seti's tomb is closed to the public. But in his unique position as the head of the Egyptian Antiquities Service, Dr. Hawass is the only person in the world with the power to order the tomb to be opened. I will take you now for one big reason, to show to the public that this is the most amazing tomb. The entrance sweeps down through the bedrock. The tomb, it's deep cut in the rock, more than 300 feet. 
It contains some of the most spectacular artwork in all ancient Egypt. Every available surface is painted. The thing that just takes your breath away is not only the beauty of the forms, but also the absolute vivacious colors that they use. One of the beautiful scenes, it shows the relationship between Siti the first and the goddess Maat. But what's amazing, in all the scenes, you can see she's holding him to show her support and her blessing for him to go to the afterlife. Archaeologists are analyzing the artwork to better understand what the Egyptians believed would happen to the pharaoh after death. This is one of the two tombs in the Valley of the Kings that tells us how this tomb will make the king as a god. Underlying that is the Egyptians' belief that by day, the sun god Ra drove the sun across the sky, bringing life to the land. But by night, he traveled to the underworld to fight off the demons that threatened the land of Egypt. This cycle was of vital importance to the ancient Egyptians. They believed if it was not completed, the sun would not rise, the Nile would not flow, and the world would end. Seti's task after death was to join with the god in this struggle. The king will join with the solar cycle during the hours that it passes through the underworld. And it's extremely important that he be part of that cycle because this would be his function in the next world. Seti had to be sure that he would rise again after death to fulfill this duty and his destiny. The artwork he commissioned for his tomb was a magic spell to facilitate his resurrection. Magical spells are like instruction manuals or computer software. They function, they achieve their end. This wasn't art. It was logical, functional, like lines of code programmed into a machine. The tomb is a resurrection machine. It functions, it actually achieves a purpose. The scenes themselves and the words inscribed on the walls of these tombs are like computer code or an instruction manual. The coded artwork reveals how the Egyptians considered mysticism and magic. It was real. Once you believe in magic, then a magic wand is no different than a hammer. It is a tool. It functions. It actually achieves a purpose. We are now at the end place of the tomb. The images on the walls here represent paradise. The god Osiris ruled in paradise. The artwork clearly shows Seti meeting and joining with the god. How could Seti be with Osiris in paradise at exactly the same time as also being in the underworld fighting demons? For the Egyptians, to do two things at once was not a problem. The ancient Egyptians were very clever about their afterlife. They believe in multitasking. Egyptian religious philosophy allowed its gods and pharaohs to be in many places at the same time. But we have to understand that the rational point of view, the logical point of view, is a construct of the Western mind that comes out of ancient Greece. The ancient Egyptians, rather than seeing things as contradictions, saw them as essentially two sides of the same coin. Seti's tomb is a clue to how very differently the ancient Egyptians saw the world from our view today. They had many beliefs that we might find alien, like pharaohs becoming gods and souls being in two places at once, and that objects and images had real and practical magical powers. They venerated their gods in some of the largest temples in history. The seventh discovery reveals that ancient Egypt was built on an even larger scale than previously thought, and that its most impressive achievements may still lie buried beneath the ground. Ancient Egypt's ten greatest discoveries reveal the secrets of a world that flourished 5,000 years ago. But some estimates suggest that 70% of Egyptian remains still lie buried underground. Egypt is unique 
among any civilization in the world that the whole country, there is buried temples and tombs under the ground. Monuments like the lost temple of Akhmim. There are theories which suggest that the ancient Egyptians built many more great monuments than previously thought. The lost temple of Akhmet provides dramatic evidence to support this claim. Egypt is famous for the pyramids near Giza in the north. Visitors also flock to the expansive temple complexes in the south at Luxor. But new evidence is suggesting that the Egyptians built on a colossal scale across the whole of the country. Central Egypt is little known territory to tourists and even to many professional Egyptologists. This could be another major touristic destination in Egypt in the future. Might this little known area produce the largest temple ever discovered? Akmim is located in central Egypt, 200 miles south of Cairo. Here there is evidence for a massive temple, but it is buried underneath the modern city. It's very difficult for archaeologists to work on Egyptian settlements because, for one thing, if it was a good place to live in the past, it's still a good place to live and people are still living there. One of the problems with Akmim is that it is a living town and city that's grown up over millennia, and so the ancient core of Akmim has been absorbed by the urban development. But the development of the modern city can also be an advantage. The process of digging foundations can reveal the past. Development is a double-edged sword, especially in Egypt. So when at a site like Akmim, they decide to build a post office in the 1980s, and they sink you know, some trenches, they come upon a magnificent statue. In 1981, while digging the foundations for a new development, workers uncovered the base of an enormous statue. The statue was of Ramesses the Great, one of Egypt's most powerful pharaohs. The height of this statue could be more than 180 feet. It was huge. Only 60 yards away, another massive statue was discovered. We are in front of uh, the feet of the largest, the most complete, beautiful statue of a female lady ever made in ancient Egypt. The statue is of Ramesses' wife, Merit Amun. Many believe that she was the queen who found Moses in the bulrushes and brought him up as her son. The scale of the two statues are a clue to how big the temple may have been. But whatever other ruins exist are buried beneath the modern town. Archaeologists must discover what lies there without digging. Egyptology is a very rigorous science because it doesn't just involve excavation. It also involves a great deal of analysis. The expert's first clue is in the writings of travelers from over a thousand years ago. They tell of a colossal site at Akhmim. When the Arab travelers came to Egypt in the 9th century AD, and they explained that they came to visit the temples at the sunrise, and they left at the sunset. The sun had time to rise and sit again before I finished exploring the ruins. A second clue to the scale of the construction is that all temples in Egypt followed a similar plan. Temples in ancient Egypt are the abode of the gods. It's sort of the point where the divine realm uh, you know, connects with the human realm. In the architecture, they model ideas of the cosmos, and there's sort of a formal layout of ancient Egyptian temples. As churches, mosques, and temples, even today, follow a prescribed standard layout, so did the temples of Egypt. So if archaeologists analyze a fully visible temple, they can apply this knowledge to the site at Akhmim. 
the temple of Amun-Ra, a hundred miles further south in Luxor. In analyzing the standard layout of Luxor Temple, archaeologists can base their predictions of where the rest of the site at Akmim is buried. Mansour Bareik is a specialist in temple design. I think the temple of Akmim was bigger than this, but it has the same layout which we have now in Luxor Temple. A standard temple layout always begins with a long paved avenue. This leads to a massive gate flanked by two statues. And at Akhmen, this is where the statue of Ramesses would have stood. Inside is a courtyard. This would have been the location of the statue of Queen Merit Amun. But this is only the beginning. There are further courtyards, stretching 800 feet to the inner sanctuary of the temple. The layout of Luxor Temple can be applied to Akmim. I have an image of the site here on the computer. By matching the locations of the Akmim statues to the Luxor Temple plan, Dr. Wegner can estimate the true scale of Akmim Temple. A sense of the scale of the temple can be hinted at by the, uh, the soccer field located in the, uh, the upper right-hand side of the Google Earth image. Um, you can see that the you know, the probable extent of this New Kingdom temple encompasses maybe four or five times the length of that soccer field. In doing so, you get a sense of, you know, quite a massive temple. Even without full excavation, by using this analysis, archaeology can affirm that the temple at Akhmet was built on a massive scale. This could be the beginning of the temple, and the sanctuary should be under the houses here. More excavation and development must be done before the extent of the temple can be revealed for certain. We'll be able, actually, to discover the whole temple. But one thing is clear. A new picture of ancient Egypt is being revealed. A larger and more developed country than previously imagined. A continuous band of development along the entire length of the Nile, not just at today's famous sites in the north and the south, but right through central Egypt too. Evidence of a civilization more impressive than had ever been thought. And the most successful ruler of this superpower was Ramesses the Great. Discoveries on the walls of one of the most impressive temples in Egypt reveal the dilemma that nearly destroyed his role as pharaoh. The story is revealed in the eighth discovery, the temple at Abu Simbel. From tombs to temples, the mysteries of ancient Egypt have enthralled the world for centuries. One of the most significant is also one of the largest. Fronted by four statues of Ramesses the Great, the temple is Abu Simbel. The epitome of Ramsey's ego, if you will, or Ramsey's godhood, the spectacular nature of his achievements has got to be Abu Simbel. The temple of Abu Simbel is a key to solving the dilemma faced by every pharaoh, how to reign as both a god and man. Artwork on the walls tells the story of how close the great pharaoh Ramesses II came to failing in his mission. Abu Simbel is in the south of Egypt, near the border with modern-day Sudan. Hewn out of the rock are four giant statues, and every inch of the temple's walls are covered with illustrations depicting the triumph of the pharaoh. In 1871, when the adventurer and early Egyptologist Giovanni Belzoni arrived at the site, the temple was covered with sand. Belzoni set to work to remove the thousands of tons of sand, but every bucket he removed was replaced by yet more sliding down the dune. On the point of giving up, he discovered a simple solution to the seemingly impossible problem, wetting the sand would hold it in place. The plan was a success, 
After four years of struggle, he finally found the temple entrance and became the first man for centuries to walk inside. The temple at Abu Simbel was a monument to Egypt's greatest builder, warrior, and pharaoh, Ramesses II. Ramesses II was one of the famous kings in the ancient Egyptian history. He ruled more than uh, 67 years and turned the land of Egypt to be an open museum for his achievements. But analysis of the wall art and statues is revealing the dual role of a pharaoh of Egypt. The first function is as defender of the nation. He's the warrior champion, the single hero who, who defends Egypt from all enemies. The second role involves religion. The role of the pharaoh in the religious realm is not just as chief worshiper or intermediary between mankind and the gods, but the king has one foot in the divine world and one foot in the human world. The pharaoh's authority and power was dependent on fulfilling these two roles. But Ramesses was so successful as the warrior king that he ran out of people to fight and thus undermined his position as ruler. Reliefs within the temple illustrate this dilemma. The story begins with a battle, the Battle of Kadesh. Ramses II had this big, important battle with the Battle of Kadesh with the Hittites. We can see written in the temple. During the first part of Ramesses' reign, Egypt was at war with its powerful neighbor, the Hittites. The Hittites ruled an empire that stretched from northern Turkey into Syria. Between them and the Egyptians lay the town of Kadesh. Reliefs on the walls of Abu Simbel contain the oldest complete record of a military engagement in history. Dr. Mohammed El Bailey is investigating the brutality of the battle. Here, the figure showing the Egyptian beating and punishing Hittites. They are beating them very hard. It was a clash of superpowers. What makes Kadesh so unique is that it really is a class of empires. Ramses finds the whole Hittite army with all of the Hittites' allies are there facing on the battlefield. And in fact, I think this was something relatively rare in ancient history, the two huge armies clashed with each other on the battlefield. Abu Simbel reliefs depict a violent battle using the most technologically advanced weapons available at the time. They had the chariot for the first time, and they had the horse, and therefore they were able to build the empire. An Egyptian chariot is very highly maneuverable. It can turn on a dime, and they can basically make what are essentially missile runs. It's essentially the F-16 of the ancient world. Chariot warfare involved making 30 mile an hour runs at the enemy, firing as many arrows as possible, and then wheeling into a retreat. Basically making strafing runs, going close, shooting his arrows, and then his chariot driver would veer his chariot around, he would speed off until he could get back out of range, and then make another strafing run on them. Ramesses held the Hittites at bay and successfully defended his country. In the 21st year of his reign, he makes a peace deal with the Hittite Empire. With no battles left to fight, Ramesses could not fulfill the warrior function of Pharaoh. What do you do when you run out of enemies? So now Ramesses has a political problem. Abu Simbel reveals Ramesses' solution. And the way he solves this is by going in the opposite extreme and emphasizing his religious role. Now that he can't show that he's a warrior because there's nobody left to fight, he can say, I'm a living god. Ramesses declared his divinity. Now at this point, Ramses puts both feet in the divine world and he becomes a living god 24-7 all year round. The Egyptians have a living god ruling over them. Abu Simbel became not just a temple to the gods, but a temple to Ramesses himself as a god. Ramses II built this temple for himself, as a god, to worship himself. Here we are arrived to the sanctuary, the holy of the holy place, where Ramses II defied and placed between the other gods. And you have his statue in the sanctuary. 
with the other statues of the three major gods of Egypt, and he's one of them, equal to them. This was a political masterstroke. This was the perfect cover of that of living God for a frail old man. And we know nothing about his mental faculties. Could he even see anymore had he gone blind? We simply don't know. The temple at Abu Simbel reveals the two most important parts of being Pharaoh, defending Egypt and communing with the gods. It reveals how Ramesses solved the problem of being too successful at the first role, that of defender, by becoming a living god. The penultimate discovery of the top 10 continues the story of the great pharaohs in the years after they died. It is a turbulent tale involving organized crime, robbery, murder, and state-sanctioned terrorism, and reveals the mystery of the missing royal mummies. The 10 greatest discoveries of Egypt let us see the world of an empire that lasted 3,000 years. Much of what we know of ancient Egypt comes from opening the tombs of the pharaohs, but they also created a mystery. Time and time again, the tombs were discovered empty. The pharaohs' mummies were missing. One of the most important discoveries in Egyptian archaeology was the discovery of the royal caste. Egyptologists came face to face with literally a who's who of all the great kings. The discovery of the cache, or hiding place, of missing royal mummies reveals insights into the political state of Egypt at the height of her power. A story of organized crime and state-sanctioned terrorism that nearly destroyed a nation. The evidence lies on the west bank of the Nile. The Valley of the Kings contains 63 tombs for some of the greatest pharaohs of Egypt. Nearly every tomb has been discovered empty. The treasures and mummies gone. But about three miles away from the Valley of the Kings is another canyon. It contains no tombs, and it was thought, no secrets. Then in 1890, a shepherd was searching the cliffs for a lost goat. In a crevice halfway up one of the cliffs, he came across the entrance to a cave. And when he entered inside the shaft, he saw a corridor, maybe more than 200 feet cut in the rock. Inside were the remains of over 50 different burials, including the mummies of some of the greatest pharaohs in history. To solve the riddle of why the mummies were there, archaeologists must look at the political and social state of Egypt 3,000 years ago. Drought and infighting between rival political factions was bringing the country into a state of anarchy. All these problems, the ecological, political, foreign invasions, you basically have a case of systems collapse. When a complex governmental system is facing multiple threats, multiple problems that it can deal with one on one, but when they all happen at the same time, the system can't take it and the whole thing cascades and fails. Society broke down. The population was facing famine and poverty. The need for gold drove the people to the one place they knew they would find it, the tombs of the pharaohs. At night, people used to go and go inside to look for mummies and enter inside the tombs and rob everything. These acts of sacrilege were born out of desperation. Once that line between civilization and chaos is crossed, nothing, not even belief in the gods, fear of sacrilege and fear of eternal damnation will prevent you from robbing tombs and violating temples. But this was not the work of random criminals. It definitely was organized crime. It was well-structured, organized groups of men with even sort of an internal ranking system amongst them. Tomb robbery as kind of a, a growth industry, really. 
This created one of the first examples of organized crime in history. Literally everybody gets into the tomb robbing business. Everybody is in on it, from the highest officials, if not involved actually in robbing the tombs, then turning a blind eye and getting a golden handshake. But there were some priests at the Temple of Luxor who still saw themselves as the guardians of the Egyptian religion, the temples and the tombs of the pharaohs. They set out to rescue and hide the mummies. They want to protect the kings. They took all the mummies, they buried them here. Even away from everyone, they did not reveal the secrets to anyone. The fact that the priests saved these mummies allows scientists to study the physical remains of some of antiquity's most powerful rulers. If you close your eyes and you go back thousands of thousands of years, you can imagine this living king. After the mummies were discovered, they were taken to the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, where they are cased in sterile conditions. If you enter inside this room now, you see dead bodies and you look at them, you get scared, and you laugh, and you cry, and you smile. But when I use science, this is the first time that all these mummies will talk to us. But what's most revealing is what isn't there. Pharaohs were buried with priceless treasures, but none of these mummies were found with any valuables. When you look at these stripped-down coffins, you find that the gold and other jewels and finery has actually been systematically taken off of some of them. This offers evidence for a high-level conspiracy theory. When somebody's robbing a tomb in the middle of the night and is afraid they're going to get killed or the god is going to strike them down, they are going to be in a hurry, they're going to be scared out of their wits, and they're going to just grab whatever they can get and run. But these bodies have been methodically stripped. This suggests that the high priests themselves are doing this. The very people that saved them actually removed the last bits of gold and finery that were still attached. Although the priests were both rescuers and robbers, they left science with an invaluable resource. It was sort of a double-edged sword, because you can say that they were doing a good thing by hiding these mummies in a secret place and protecting them in this way, but they also stole along the way. Forensic investigations reveal the real lives of great pharaohs. But from this discovery, we can also gain an insight into ancient Egyptian society. A society on the verge of anarchy. And when the nation imploded, other empires were quick to take advantage, and Egypt suffered hundreds of years of invasion. But instead of being destroyed, the Egyptian culture was so strong that the invaders actually adopted the customs and beliefs of their new home. This accomplishment is spectacularly revealed in the final discovery. The evidence lies both on and under the desert sand. If you go down under the ground, you find mummies covered with gold. Hundreds of perfectly preserved, untouched mummies, covered with gold. For centuries, the ancient civilization of Egypt has captured the imagination of scientists, archaeologists, and adventurers. Now, guided by Dr. Zahi Hawass, a team of experts has selected the 10 greatest discoveries that tell us about this extraordinary civilization. Even in its final decline, the ancient Egyptian culture created something which, when discovered thousands of years later, would still inspire awe. A field of mummies, still untouched. If you look around you, right or left, or any place, you will dig and you will discover mummies. Over its history, Egypt was attacked by many empires. The evidence says that Egyptian culture had the strength to resist and endure. 
Egyptian culture, Egyptian society, Egyptian religious beliefs conquered the conquerors. The Bahariya Oasis in the Western Desert. The first clues that this area is unusual lie on the sand itself. Bones and skulls litter the valley floor. The skeletons belong to buried corpses. They have been dug up by wild animals, a sign of what secrets lie beneath the sand. The discovery was made not by an adventurer or an archaeologist. In fact, the discoverer could not even speak. The discovery happened by accident. In 1994, a donkey got lost in the desert. When the owner came to look for his beast, he found it rooted to the spot, staring into a hole in the desert. He looked. Inside the hole, he saw mummies. And I came here, and we began our excavation. It was like a dream. The discovery of so many untouched mummies is a priceless gift to modern science. Throughout early Egyptian archaeology, many, many cemeteries were excavated by early Egyptologists who dug up the bodies, the bones, and the mummies were thrown away. They were dispersed. Early explorers often discarded the mummies in their search for treasure. Mummies were lost in ways that shock modern archaeologists. They were even used for fuel to cook dinners. The mummies found at Bahariya are a rare resource, uncontaminated, undamaged. We have an entire population of people, generation after generation, in one place. 2,000 years ago, Egypt was invaded by the Romans, who settled across the country. The mummies buried in the valley were of these Romans. They date to around 300 BC. They're going after Egypt because it's one of the wealthiest countries in the Mediterranean. It has all of the gold of Africa. It has the grain. It has all of the resources of Pharaoh. So this is a little jewel in the crown of any empire. The settlements here were destroyed over time. But studies of the mummies reveal that nothing could destroy the Egyptian culture. The Egyptians had such a strong sense of culture, such a long history, that really they changed the invaders more than the invaders changed them. These were Roman mummies. But Egyptian culture still determined the manner of their burial. Mummification started 3000 BC, and it continued all over the Egyptian history until the Roman period. Until they came to Egypt, the Romans wrapped their corpses in strips of linen. In the beginning, most of the mummies, their faces covered with linen like this completely. But the Egyptians produced coffins and death masks with faces. Here we have this mask with the face, and all the other mummies have masks. The masks reveal the change from Roman style to Egyptian as the invaders became naturalized see this cultural unification, this cultural melding going on right before our eyes from generation to generation. But the mummies hold another secret. To investigate this, a selection had been moved to a facility where they have been cleaned and restored. Here in sealed cases, the masks reveal even more insights into the Egyptian culture. The mummies are covered in gold. The ancient Egyptians loved gold. It was obviously one of the most expensive things in the ancient world. But most importantly for the Egyptians, they believed that the body of a god was made out of gold. This reveals an insight into what the ancient Egyptians believed about reincarnation in the afterlife. When you die, you are transformed from a mortal into a divine being, which is why they had gold on, sometimes literally on the face, otherwise on the coffins or sarcophagi, because that showed that you had been transformed from the mortal state to the divine. The mummies are evidence that the Romans adopted the Egyptian use of gold in their religious beliefs. And yet the design of the faces reflects the Roman influence of these new settlers.
the golden mummies are evidence of the fusion of the pharaonic and the Roman into the new Egyptian civilization. Something to please the Roman and something to please the Egyptians. The mummies in the valley demonstrate that whatever happened in her history, Egypt was both ultimately strong and flexible. This allowed a continuation of belief and tradition that was always essentially Egyptian. The sense of identity gave them a sort of stability to throw off any empire and embrace whatever new one was next. Now we've revealed Egypt's greatest discoveries. We can bring them together. We'll complete the picture of the world of the ancient Egyptians, a world that has remained powerful and captivating right up to the present day. Discoveries from ancient Egypt have spanned hundreds of years of adventure and exploration. From early adventurers to forensic scientific analysis, each discovery has shed a new light on a civilization that began 50 centuries ago. The ancient Egyptians were the, simply the most fascinating and entertaining people that ever lived in the ancient world. But Egyptology holds more than fascination for academics and scientists. It has a resonance that affects the modern world, even today. The ancient Egyptian legacy is still alive, 2,000 years after the civilization itself collapsed. They are the mother of many, many cultural traditions that we consider our birthright even in America or the European context today. One of the most important legacies left to modern life by the ancient Egyptians is the science of medicine. The earliest record of a professional physician in history was a man named Imhotep, working in Egypt nearly 5,000 years ago. The surgical skills of the ancient Egyptians were developed, not to keep a person alive in this life, but for a completely different reason, to preserve them for the next. Studies made on the mummified bodies of pharaohs have revealed the great expertise the Egyptians developed in dissection. Successful mummification was a complicated procedure that involved careful removal of key organs without damaging the body itself. Just as in many types of modern surgery, it required a deep knowledge of anatomy. In some cases, this knowledge has been passed down unchanged through the ages, right into modern medical textbooks. And medicine is not alone in the debt it owes the ancient Egyptians. Modern engineering and construction techniques rely on the knowledge developed along the Nile Valley over four and a half thousand years ago. The Great Pyramid at Giza is built with such accuracy that its width varies by less than two inches across its 750-foot length. The Greek genius Pythagoras is known as the father of numbers. He trained in Egypt. Here he developed algebraic formulas that provide much of the basis for modern engineering and construction. The more modern scientists explore the world of the ancient Egyptians, the more they reveal the debt that we owe this civilization. The quest for new discoveries is being pursued every day. It's up to new people to kind of come around trying to discover if there's any more you know, discoveries of this type to make. But that's an exciting way to, to do the search. One new avenue for investigation lies in the Valley of the Kings. From the tomb of Seti I to the treasures of Tutankhamun, the valley has produced many of the most important discoveries of ancient Egypt. But it may still hold more undiscovered secrets. This was confirmed by the discovery of a new tomb in 2006 called KV-63. Many scientists believe there are more undiscovered tombs in the valley. I think not all pharaoh's uh, burial sites are known, so I think the opportunities are still there. Text records list many more pharaohs than the number of tombs discovered. 
That's the exciting part of it, that there's at least one validation of the concept. New scientific analysis is revealing ways to begin the search for new tombs. Archaeologists are suggesting that the ancient Egyptians surveyed natural weaknesses and fractures in the rock to make it easier to carve out the tombs. So once you find the zone of fracture concentration and ex extrapolate its trend, the tomb builder could follow that by good fortune and he would stay right along because it's almost a straight line. Richard Perizek is surveying these fractures in the Valley of the Kings. Now, this is a zone of fracture concentration that, and you'll notice uh, the fracture pattern just jumps right out at you. If the ancient engineers dug tombs along fracture lines thousands of years ago, then fracture lines are a good place to look for a new tomb today. That gives you some search pattern that might say, look, if you're going to go looking, take a, include this as part of your search technique. Only time will tell whether this approach will produce a discovery as extraordinary as the tomb of King Tutankhamun. But all archaeologists agree on one thing. There are more discoveries to be found. Future generations will have a different idea of the top 10 discoveries and their importance because of the scientific methods that continue to evolve in archaeology. As scientists follow in the footsteps of early pioneers like Carter or Belzoni, they continue to make new discoveries. You never know what the sand of Egypt may hide of secrets. These secrets are revealing not only the mysteries of an extraordinary empire, but also the powerful legacy that 3,000 years of civilization left for the modern world. And while the modern world continues to wonder at today's greatest discoveries, the discoveries of tomorrow promise to bring even greater insight, amazement, and knowledge of one of the greatest civilizations in history, the lasting civilization of the ancient Egyptians.